Hello everyone, welcome back to another Bible study and episode review in Shady Oak Ministries. I'm Shady Oak, and today we're going to be discussing episode 3 of season 7 of the TV show My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, the episode of Flurry of Emotions. And today was a very well-enjoyed episode, not just because Flurry Heart couldn't be cuter. The antics of a newborn baby, especially one with alicorn powers, remains a very well-executed plot point from the writers of My Little Pony, and one that I love dearly just because not only are the antics of babies just incessantly amusing to me, but it's also important to note how many things we can learn about the nature of God and how he relates to us when we see the reverse roles being played in a baby's relationship with the one who's taking care of them. Most of those lessons, yes, are through the school of hard knocks, but if you can afford the tuition, you gain a lot of wisdom from it, which is what we're going to be talking about today, wisdom. If you could turn with me to the book of Psalms, chapter 90, or Psalm 90, if you'd prefer. In verse 12, David says something very interesting about what our relationship with God should ultimately entail, not as far as our view and respect for him, but ultimately what that relationship looks like in the horizontal. Because while Psalm 90 is chock full of points about our vertical relationship with God, the vertical is the first step, and the most important, mind you, but not the last step in what ultimately affects our horizontal relationships. Because God gave us two commandments, love me and your neighbor. And that's ultimately what we're going to see illustrated in today's episode today. Psalm 90 and verse 12, David says, So teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. This is discussing the topic of time management. And among other things, that is a very tricky topic to master because it's not always, as far as where and how and why you spend your time, Not always choosing the right thing from the wrong thing, although that is sometimes often the case, but it's oftentimes sorting out the best things from the good things. And that is always the most difficult choice to make. And that's what wisdom is. It's the ability to make decisions effectively. Not necessarily what you know, but what you do with what you know. An example of this is what we saw in today's episode. Twilight had a full day to serve sick children by reading them stories and giving them treats. Is that a good or a bad thing? Well, according to the Bible, James chapter 1 and verse 27 makes a note and point that pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So, catering to the less fortunate, that is a clear and copy and paste example of what it looks like to model the heart of God. That's definitely not only a Christian thing to do, but even to a secular mindset, not a bad priority to have. But that wasn't Twilight's only obstacle, or opportunity, we should rather say, in today's episode, now was it? Twilight also had the opportunity to serve her favorite niece and maintain her title as Bay, Best aunt ever. I wasn't the only one who laughed at that, I hope. But understand, was that a good or a bad thing? Well, according to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, if anyone does not provide for his own, especially among those of their own household, they have denied the faith and are worse than an unbeliever. So, probably more so of a priority than the former. So, what, what's really being made the point here. We have two very Christian things to do. We have two very good priorities to have. But ultimately, what decision was made? Because there's only one twilight to go around. Well, she chose to take both and ended up neglecting both. Because when you take on all obligations, that's not a choice. That's not making a decision. It's, in a sense, choosing to reject both by taking on more than your ability is to handle. We need to be able to make those decisions, to number our days, and understand that there is a limit to that number, that we only have so much to offer. Therefore, our greatest priority needs to be on the most important things. Now, this is where the question comes. Well, what about all those kids? that have those various diseases and, you know, they need someone to cater to them, to encourage them. I mean, Spike himself made the point and note in saying that that always makes me feel better, treats and stories. 
and presence as well. But what was also on the other end of the spectrum? A personal relationship invested in not only the life of her brother, her sister-in-law, but also her niece. Your own family, the relationship that should matter to you more than any other on this earth. What do I invest in? What do I do? And when she tried to be in two places at once, what happened? Well, when she tried to invest in games, it ended up robbing from the time that she could have been doing, investing in the children, and ended up not only when she finally did invest in the children, neglecting Flurry Heart, but also at the same time creating more chaos in noting that, oh, I remember from season six that an alicorn baby is definitely not something you want to leave unattended. So understand the kind of situation we have here. She did not use effective discernment in choosing everything, but making a choice to choose one thing would have been wiser. Now, how do we effectively make those kinds of decisions? What would have been the right choice in this situation? Well, if we don't have a perfect example in Twilight, someone who had to learn through the School of Hard Knocks, as we noted earlier, but instead could look to someone who would provide a more exemplary image of what proper time management looked like. Do we have a picture of anyone's life on Earth who would be able to show us what kind of decisions the perfect person would make? None other than Jesus Christ. If we call ourselves Christians, he is our example. So what did he do with the wisdom the opportunities that he had in life and the choices he made therein. Well, here's a few examples of what ultimately were his priorities. He, in one sense, in uh, one record of his life in the Gospels, he had the opportunity to teach the Bible to a group of people, but he also knew that they weren't listening to what he had to say. So what did he choose to do? He left and taught elsewhere. They wouldn't listen to him in Nazareth, so he left and taught in Capernaum. Now, this is probably something that we consider strange. Why would you leave a group of people and stop teaching God's word? Well, because he knew that their hearts wouldn't receive it, and it would ultimately be wasting time. There were people who would hear what he had to say. Therefore, his priority was to abandon those who wouldn't hear what he had to say, no matter how much time he invested in them and chose to go to those who would listen to what he had to say. Because Jesus, when he came to this earth, limited himself to the same problem we all have. We only have one of us to go around. He made the point in noting that would no longer limit him in John chapters 14 through 16. I'm going to the Father, but if I go to the Father, then I can be with all of you at once. So, making the point in note, he had the opportunity to teach God's word. Good thing. But he also knew in their hearts, attitudes, minds, they weren't receiving what he had to say. Therefore, his priority was with someone who would hear what he had to say. Another example would be when he had the chance to perform miracles, to demonstrate his power as the divine being that he was. But these miracles were being performed for people who were just using him for entertainment. Therefore, he did no more miracles. Once again, in Nazareth, because of their unbelief, he moved on to Capernaum. Why? Because he understood their attitudes and hearts would not benefit, no matter how much time he invested in them. That was the wisdom of it. He said, it is better to spend time doing the right thing in the right place than the wrong thing at the wrong place with the wrong people. Another example, he was asked by his family Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, and Judas, as well as his sisters, to come out. We need to talk to you. We, we want you to stop talking all this crazy I am God nonsense. We just, just stop. You're embarrassing us, Jesus. Come on. Come on out. And Jesus heard what his family had to say. Now, family's a priority, isn't it? But what did Jesus do? He knew that his family hadn't gotten the whole picture yet. He knew that this would make sense to his family once he had verified his divinity, not just in his teachings or miracles, but a resurrection from the dead. So what did he say? He said, who are my mother and my brothers? These are my mother and my brothers, those who are listening to what he had to say. He understood the hearts, the mind, the attitudes of Mary, his mother, 
and of his brothers and sisters. They didn't get it yet. Therefore, he'd invest the time in them when they were in the right frame of mind. But right now, he needed to invest in people who were there to hear what he had to say. He wouldn't invest his time with the wrong people in the wrong, or rather the right people, but in the wrong place, in the wrong frame of mind, at the wrong time. And most applicable to today's message, or episode rather, was the incident with Lazarus. When his friend was sick, and seriously sick, mind you, and he sent people to Jesus and asked him to come and heal him, Jesus chose to wait. In fact, he waited so long that Lazarus ended up dying from the fever. And there was a number of questions that people gave to him, but ultimately what was accomplished? Jesus didn't just go to Lazarus' location and commanded a fever to be healed. That would be remarkable. But he allowed them the opportunity to see an even greater miracle by commanding someone to return from the dead, even when decomposition had started to break in. So understand all of this. Jesus' perspective, his priorities, his sense that gave him the wisdom that he had was all based on his ability to discern the hearts and attitudes of men, not just in always doing the right thing, but with the right people at the right time. And ultimately, that's what it was described for us in John chapter 2, verse 24 through 25. Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, I describe all this to you. I describe twilight in the relatable way that we have all found ourselves in when we took on too much that we could handle and ended up paying the consequences. We couldn't choose between one or the other, so we chose both and ended up neglecting both at the same time. But then I go on to describe Jesus and how he was able to supernaturally set priorities for himself in the way that only God could. And the funny thing is, you listen to me saying this and say, yeah, I kind of relate more to the alicorn pony princess than I do the son of God who came here on earth. And that guy's the historical figure. How do I benefit from this? Well, here's the good news. While we may not be Jesus, we have access to him. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me. All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And for those of you who don't know, that's an ox goad, something that would harness and allow you to carry burdens. Look at Big Macintosh, that little wooden collar. That's a yoke. You'd tie something to it, and it would allow you to carry burdens effectively. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy perfectly fitted for you. And my burden isn't non-existent, but it is light. Now here's the most important thing for us to understand as Christians. When we understand that the moment we start trusting Jesus, he enters our hearts and lives, the presence of the Holy Spirit now makes us one with the Father in the same way that the Son and the Father were one with one another in perfect fellowship on this earth. Now note, we may not be members of the Trinity, but we are in perfect fellowship with the Father now. Our fallen sinful nature is the only thing that stands in the way of that. And I just mean the natural inclination to want to do things our own way. But here's ultimately what it comes down to. How do we benefit from Jesus' practical wisdom? How do we discern the hearts, minds, and attitudes of men if we don't have Professor Xavier mind-reading powers? How do we make effective decisions in the same way that Jesus did during his time on earth? How do we become Christians in the way that we model Jesus' wisdom and decision-making, his time management, the same way that Jesus numbered his days? How do we do that and gain a heart of wisdom, as Psalm 90 and verse 12 said? Well, first, understand that God loves you. In the same way that we saw this illustrated by Fleury's parents and her aunt, We know that God will take care of us. And not only that, but he wants to. Because that's the second point. God has you as his priority. If cadence and shining armor 
when they went to the art show, <laughs> Spearhead. And every time they looked at something, couldn't help but think of Flurry, even when, and I laughed so hard at this, this reminds me of Flurry. Why? It's small. <laughs> if a father's love like shining armor could give us the even most faint illustration of the father's love for us, if they could learn the lesson that, you know what, it was good to take a day, but I miss my baby. I want her to be with me again. Do you think that God will ever leave you in the first place? He doesn't take days off. He knows what will ultimately be not only the greatest blessing to him, but the greatest benefit for you. You are his priority. And thirdly, and most importantly, let him sort out the details of how you spend your time. That is how we effectively model Jesus' behavior. We trust him to schedule our itinerary. We don't neglect Spike and spend time focusing all on fun. There are times to work, but we also don't neglect work so much that there are no times for fun when it is actually warranted, when baby actually needs attention. Un understand this. God knows when you need correction. God knows when you just need your whammy, Flurry Heart. But also understand, most importantly, he understands when is the most effective time, not only for fun, but for work, and to somehow make the two of them the same kind of blessing. You're fulfilling your purpose for existence. In the same way that Jesus said in John chapter 17, when he prayed for himself, he said, I have fulfilled the purpose in which you sent me to glorify you. And understand, that term glorify, it's a big churchy term. We defined it before, I'll do it once again. It's just to show the world how good God is. Let's do the same in our lives and remind not only the world, but ourselves that he's a good parent, that he's not only the best aunt ever, but let's do BGE, he's the best God ever. Thank you for your time and listening to this study. If you have any sincere questions, leave them in the comments below. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, you know where to go. But most importantly, if you know someone who perhaps could use these reminders, could benefit from these clarifications, who could just use this time in God's word and meeting them halfway with something that they're already familiar with in My Little Pony, please share this study with anyone you feel would be blessed by it. Thank you for your time and listening to this study. And once again, if it wasn't clear before, remember that Jesus loves you. Not just because it's his nature, but in the perfect way that we have never seen the likes of anywhere else on this earth. The best God ever. Let's patent that phrase.